Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Acts 2, verses 41 to 47. And those who, were gl- who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You may be seated. So this is the fourth week um, of looking at Acts chapter 2, sixth week that we've been in the book of Acts. And we saw from the beginning then that Jesus had called the apostles before the, um, his ascension and he told them, commanded them to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them with power. And we saw that that happened. Prior to that happening, the, those apostles gathered together in the upper room for prayer. And so they they gathered together and they they prayed. And while they were praying, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak with other languages. And they began to testify to to the Jews and proselytes who had gathered together in Jerusalem for the Feast um, of Weeks. Hebrew, Shavuot, we call it Pentecost. Uh, Again, Pentecost is because of the 50 days between the Feast of Firstfruits in this feast, the Feast of Ingathering. And so, all that's going on, Peter then begins to, to proclaim. Remember, we're told that he, he utters clearly, because the Holy Spirit gives him utterance. He's uttering clearly to them. And he begins to teach them, and to, to preach to them, and to proclaim to them that Jesus came, that he ministered among them with their miracles. And then he died, he was killed, and he was resurrected. But in that part where he explains that Jesus died or was killed, he makes the accusation. You killed him. The one whom God sent to be your Messiah, you killed. But God raised him from the dead. And we saw then last week that in that message, that the result of that message, the the impact of the message, was that the people then responded to him, what shall we do? And Peter then replied to them, repent and be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. And so that day, 3,000 souls, this is where we picked up our, our Bible reading this morning, and that day, 3,000 souls were added. 3,000 people believed on that day, and they were immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. The church drastically changed. In that moment, they went from 120 people meeting in an upper room, praying to 3,120 people. Math problems. Okay. Love math problems. We had 120. We added 3,000. Now we have 3,120. Can't continue to do that through the book of um, Acts though, because God goes from adding to multiplying. We'll see that later on. It's kind of fun. Then all of a sudden you're talking about the the, the growth happening, but it's hard to put 3,120 people in the upper room. Isn't that something to think about? And now, what are you going to do? Where do you meet? I mean, we're starting to burge in a little bit. Today it doesn't look like it, but we've got a lot of people missing, right? But we start, we've been talking about that, you know, about what are we going to do, you know? And we can open up the windows, and we have people sitting outside in the windows and that kind of stuff. But American culture, that doesn't float too well. You know, and, and technically we have the, uh, the, <clears throat> the fire marshal sign back there saying how many were <clears throat> technically allowed to, to put in this room. But we know we can maybe shoehorn more than that into here, right? But there comes a part where I don't think we'd get 3,120 people in this room. 
comfortably. Now, it may be like the, the Guinness Book of World Records kind of moment. You know, how many people can you fit into the, the VW bug, you know? And wouldn't that be kind of fun, you know? We could have people come take pictures, and then we get uh, thrown in court for doing it. Anyways, <laughs> 3,000. Say again? The fun, the fun would be over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many people survived that one. Anyways, I went by the door. Anyways, 3,100. And 20 people. It's kind of exciting. And so God gives us a glimpse into what that early church then looked like. What did they do? I mean, you got 3,120 new believers. How old in the Lord was the most seasoned believer? Three years ish. <laughs> Three years ish. Yeah, you got the 12 disciples, apostles, who were called by Jesus. Now, you may have some of those other 120 who've been hanging out with them for all that time, but at the most, three years. I was saved in the fall of 1985. No, I'm sorry, 1984. 1984. Jessica was born as a one year present to me in, in 1985. So, in the fall, so around November ish of, of 1984, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I went to seminary, began seminary in August of 1987. I wasn't even three years old in the Lord. But I felt God called immediately that there was a need for people to hear the gospel. And I knew that if I started a secular job, what happens? You'll stay there. That's exactly right. So, so people say, well, you know, if you just work for a while and you save money. It's like, no, no, no. I got, God's calling and I'm going to do this thing. But then, you know, I got through seminary in two and a half years, okay? I had so much money from the military, and I was going to do this thing. So I had three years of, of, of school to do, and so you, you buckle down, and you do it, and you get through it, okay? So that means I'm graduating in 19, May of 1990, okay? So before I was six years old in the Lord, okay, I'd finished my seminary, and I was coming back um, as an assistant pastor. 1993... April of 1993 is when I was voted on becoming the senior pastor of where I was at. The senior pastor had gone into the Air Force. We did a chiasm together. Um, I became the interim pastor while the church was trying to figure out who they were going to choose. They wound up choosing me. So April of uh, 1993. So next year in April will become 30 years I've been in the ministry officially full time. So think that one through. How long had I been saved when I became a pastor? I mean, official pastor, not more time. I mean, assistant pastor that was in the, the beginning of 92. Less than 10 years. And I can tell you from personal experience how immature I was in the Lord. How much growth needed to happen still in Christ. I can't imagine what it was like having a bunch of three-year-old believers leading 3,000 brand-new believers. If you're doing it in your own strength, if you're doing it in your own wisdom, if you're relying upon the wisdom of man. But this wasn't Peter's plan. It wasn't John's plan. It wasn't James' plan. Matthew, Alphaeus, we could go through them. It wasn't any of their plans. They were just having their, their normal day when Jesus came through and, and kind of reconfigured, gave them a new trajectory in life and said, follow me and I will make you fishers men. And they willingly laid down their nets for the guys who were fishermen. They willingly walked away from the tax collecting booth, Matthew. That's an interesting thought process too. To follow Jesus. And God didn't let him down. Last week we saw that Peter had a catch that more than rivaled that day he met Jesus when Jesus said, go out and let down your nets. And he had such a, a haul that they had to call James and John over to help him. 
and had struggled having two boats bringing it in. And now he had a haul, <laughs> 3,000 fish, 3,000 souls that God had brought into the net. Isn't that exciting? And so now God has the opportunity to do what? To mold his church as he wants to mold his church. This portion of scripture is all, has always been of great impact to me. That first church, we started to have some struggles. Whenever there's a transition in leadership, there's always some struggles. People like the, the previous guy. Uh, they don't necessarily like the new guy, especially when the new guy is young. Okay, and this is first pastorate and all this kind of stuff. Um, some people had their person that they put out saying, we want this person to be considered to be the pastor, and he wasn't to become the pastor, so people leave because of that. And so we were between 110 and 120 when I became the head pastor. We dropped instantly to about 80. That's kind of rough. Then you have the next year where things are struggles a little bit more, and people, you know, some are coming, but some are going, right? And so you're down to about 70. And so now, I'm just going to be honest what happened, okay? So now I got um, an older man coming to me, and I'm going to just try to be as generic as I can because some may know who, who I'm talking through some of this stuff. Uh, I have an older man who's a deacon come to me. I had gone to him actually for encouragement because I had heard somebody was leaving, and, um, and the person said it was my fault that they were leaving. And I was devastated by that because that's far from what I ever wanted to have happen, that me turn people away from God rather than encouraging to them. And so I called for encouragement, and I was told, yep, we know about that. In fact, we were going to talk about that Monday at the, at the deacon's meeting. And I was like, what? Can, can someone talk to me? And so we met, and our beginning of our meeting um, was, so it's been a year, have you ever considered um, going back into computer work? Or, or, or becoming a missionary, or so let's not beat around the bush. What are you saying? <laughs> Time to go. And so, so I, we talked, and I, and, and I was led to believe that this was um, the desire of the whole deacon board. Um, there were seven, and that five probably were wanting my my resignation, two wanting me to stay. And if I'm still a little nervous here, because it's, it's just, uh, every time I talk, it's always fresh. It's fresh. And, and so then we're going to have communion that night. That was the worst communion I ever had in my life. And um, so Monday night, we had a meeting, and um, there was somebody special that was brought in as well. He made some comments and whatever. So we had a conversation. It was five against two, but five wanted or for me, two were opposed to me. So it was flipped from what I was led to believe. So my comment was, okay, so military background, um, you go into a new unit, you don't start making changes until you find out what the unit is like. Um, and then, then you can start bringing changes. So it's been a year. Clearly there are things that need to change. So a week and a half from now, Thursday, we're going to have another meeting, and I want you to bring your Bibles, and we're going to study the book of Acts. And we're going to find out what the New Testament church is supposed to be. And then we're going to go there. And you can decide whether you're on the ship or off the ship, whether you're staying or you're leaving. I haven't changed from that perspective. This portion of Scripture is massive to me. This is what God wants the church to look like. This is what God wants the church to be. We're going to talk about the activity of the early church. But your activity only demonstrates who you really are. Who you are is going to come out in what you do. That's why Jesus, one word, challenge, which was the same as John the Immerser, which was the same even as Jeremiah, which was the same as Peter, which was the same as Paul, and that is repent, metanoia, change the way you think. Because if you change the way you think, you ultimately change the way you, you act. But if the world is the one that is determining how you should function, then you'll begin to look more and more like the world. But if God's word is your guidebook, and you live out Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, not just quote it, 
If you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, if you acknowledge him in all your ways, then he will direct your path. He's true. He's honest. He gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us into all truth, to remind us of the teachings of Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you honestly 100% believe that? Do you believe that if this is his body and we act like it really is his body and not my body, that he'll guide us? Not just through me. It is not Bob's church. You've heard me say this over and over again. This is not Bob's church. I understand I have a privilege of teaching. I understand I'm the primary teacher. I, I don't lessen that. I understand my authority... I, and that sounds awful, but I understand that authority structure. I understand my responsibilities. I understand my calling. But this is not my church. I die on the spot right now. This church continues. Jose's got my sermon notes sheet back there. So now, listen, Jose's got a, a bad problem, right, Jose? You're listening. Now, because now, all of a sudden, you're not just translating the Latin you know, in the Spanish. Now you've got to say it in English and then translate it. And say, you can be your own interrupter. How cool is that, Jose? Someone, my, my son told, Tim told me I need to have you up front doing it. That would slow me down. <laughs> it probably wouldn't slow me down. He, Jose would just be, and everybody would be seeing the steam come off his head. What did the early church look like what did they do the first place we start is seeing three thousand souls what saved what did those first converts do well there was such a dramatic transformation in their life that it affected even their entire community the first thing we see is the evidence of their trans transformation because immediately they were immersed in the name of jesus christ peter says they said what must we do peter said Repent and be immersed, right? So what did they do? They changed the way they thought about Jesus, and they got immersed in his name. They identified with him. It wasn't, think about it. Again, in our culture, we don't get this. They didn't put it off. It happened right then, right there. And um, did I do the numbers last week and tell you about how long this thing must have taken? I mean, even if you got 3,000 people, and it takes you know, one minute per baptism, that's 3,000 minutes. There's 60 minutes in an hour. There's 50 hours straight of baptisms, of immersions going on. And even if you say 10 out of the 12 were doing it, you got five straight hours. If the, assuming we have 10 McVeigh's baptistries that they can all be dunking in. That's why they started at the ninth, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Remember, Peter said, these guys ain't drunk like you think they are. It's only in the third hour. That means it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Do you know why they had to start that early? Because they had a whole lot of dunking going on the rest of the day. They didn't know that. All they knew, they were hanging out praying in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They started speaking in these languages, and people were drawn from everywhere. And all of a sudden, the, the biggest catch these, Peter's ever had comes about, and the rest of the day, he's spending in the water dunking people. He's cleaning his fish. <laughs> How fun is that? But these people, immediately, so I want to challenge you on that. In obedience to what the Lord has called for you to do, are you walking in obedience? Their first reaction, changing the way they think, they were going to be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. If you've never been immersed in the name of Jesus Christ and you're a believer, I want to challenge you in this. I understand I was sprinkled as a baby, but I didn't know Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was a baby. Infant baptism isn't biblical. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I was faced with that dilemma, and I got baptized. In January then of 1985, less than a week before my dad's birthday, that was a slap to my dad. For them, it's like saying everything that they brought me up in was wrong. And it wasn't meaning, I didn't mean it that way. But I understood the significance of it, of how that's going to be. Their mindset has, has changed over the years, praise God for that. And they understand the biblical testimony. But the pastor 
challenged them, so I'm going to tell you what, how, what faith I grew up in, but told them, don't worry about it, he'll always be a Lutheran. <laughs> so I'm not picking on Lutherans, okay? But the point is, they missed it. I wasn't becoming a Baptist. I wasn't becoming a Presbyterian. I wasn't becoming what I was following Jesus. That's why I said, I just want to follow Jesus at this point. First inclination, they want to be identified with Jesus Christ. Secondly, they were added to the church. I, again, I don't want to make a big deal about this other than what it is, but that's a real thing, okay? They join together for the common cause, the greater common cause of what's going to happen. There was no Lone Ranger believers. Hebrews chapter 10, we're told by the writer of Hebrews, Paul probably, but whoever the writer is, says that we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together and so much more as we see the day, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, approaching. Now, if you think that we're getting closer and closer to Jesus' return, what should that mean to you? That we should be getting together more and more and more and more and more. Again, no Lone Ranger Christians. There's a lot of believers that think, especially coming out of, out of uh, COVID. You know, at COVID, we had the, the blessings of technology where we could continue to meet from a distance. And now we have the opportunity to minister to people through Zoom. So Jimmy, praise the Lord, can Zoom in with us even while he's on the road. That's cool. Okay. But throughout Christendom, okay, there are a lot of people who aren't meeting together. I just met a, a couple um, a week and a half ago when we were out on Wednesday night. And the first thing they wanted to know whether we were still, we, we met together in person during COVID. And when I said that we, we separated for about a month and a half, two months, but we're using Zoom, they were, oh, you know, no, no faith. I was just, yeah, fa-, you know, we had faith, but we were honoring the government authority. But then I find out that the woman, the woman does online church with Elevation Worship every Sunday. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I don't get the dichotomy here. How can you blast us for honoring the governing authorities while you're still at your house? There's no in-person fellowship there. Are you tracking with me on this one? They were added to the church immediately. They understood there was a, a greater need that was going to go on. That was the immediate. But there was a continuous. And so we're told that then they were continued, verse 42, they continued steadfastly, first of all, in the apostles' doctrine. The word doctrine is also the word for teaching, okay, in the Greek. Okay? So get rid of the word doctrine if that's too big for you. Okay? And I don't mean that wrongfully, because sometimes that can be confusing. We're like, ah, what does that mean? Just the teaching. This is their teaching. Okay? And so it's a body of teaching. Okay, if you would, a, a group of teachings together what, that symbolize you. Okay? And so in Mark 1 2, we read about that the people were astonished at Jesus' teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. He spoke like it was God's word. Hmm. Who was he? God. So he spoke like it was God's word, right? Well, then we're also told then Jesus said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. So the reality is that Jesus was even saying that his teaching wasn't even his own teaching. He was only teaching as the Father gave him utterance. Think process. The Father gave Jesus the words to proclaim. He spoke them with what? Boldness, with authority, and the people were amazed. Well, you know what? The same thing holds true to the church. We'll get there in Acts 5 in a few weeks, right? But in Acts 5, the high priest asked Peter and John, and he says, did we not strictly command you not to teach? This is our store, same word, okay? That's doctrine. Did we not command you not to teach? In his name, and look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Apparently, Peter and John were preaching with what? Great boldness and authority. Why? Because they knew it was the word of God. They spoke the word of God confidently. Do you know what? 
I don't have to worry about what I'm going to teach you because it comes from God's word. If I'm proclaiming God's truth to you, I can stand with great authority when I proclaim it. When I begin to speak my own thoughts, I want it to be like the chaff which the wind drives away because it's meaningless. In a lot of churches today, they don't preach from the Word of God. They might read a verse, two verses, and then they pontificate whatever they want to talk about. I was in a, a fundamental Baptist church once. In fact, that was its name, Fundamental Baptist Church. And I witnessed it, even in a theoretically a good church. The guy read from Genesis chapter 2, then he preached against everything he didn't like. Like, this didn't come from God's word. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, and out of season, right? All right, so they stayed in the, the apostles' teaching. They stayed, secondly, in the apostles' fellowship. The word fellowship is the word koinonia. Koinonia is having all things in common. Camaraderie is the, the best word, I think, that comes back to it. Okay, All for one and one for all. That's the concept here, Okay, that we have all things in common. We're going to talk about that common this in just a moment, but this is it. Okay, They stayed in the commonness. They stayed in the fellowship of the um, apostles. And so we see in 1 John chapter 1, that John talks about this after he talks about that which we have seen in the beginning, uh, which we've heard, which we have looked upon in our hands of handle the word of Christ or the word of God, that how they had seen Christ, they touched Christ, they felt Christ, they heard Christ, and now they're going to share that with him. And he says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full right? The joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship, koinonia, with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Where we're at. We have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So in Christ... We have fellowship with one another. But our fellowship, our koinonia, our one for all and all for one, is based upon, I noted this, um, Justin, you are talking about when we were going to sing, blessed be the tie that binds, you, you said, blessed be the ties that bind. And I went, no, no, it's a tie that binds, because the tie, not ties, the tie that binds us is Jesus Christ. Do you get it? That's what brings you together. I mean, Jonathan, I'm going to pick on you for a moment, okay? Because you live on Prescott. We might have bumped into each other at some point. Possibly. Okay? We're sort of in the, in the same neighborhood subdivision. You know, mine kind of changes angles a little bit. But there's, that's a possibility. But John, we probably, unless we bumped each other in Walmart or I hit your car or you hit my car, we might not have ever met. I certainly wouldn't know the Fishers. I mean, you guys are way out yonder in the Yankee Yank over that way, and then you work way over yonder in the Yankee Yank, but you come all this distance, okay? What brings us together? The bond of Christ. That's why I chose Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 for us to sing, not just as another memory song. Praise God that God gave Justin the wisdom how to put that into to music, and I can sing. I've been singing it. All week. It sounds like fun. So you get to join my pain. Okay, but anyways, but not pain. It's a, it's a good pain. But I've been singing it, you know, that there's the, the unity that, that we ought to have. But that unity starts with the apostles' fellowship. That there's a, a joint coming together because they're joining in this teaching and then they're joining in their fellowship. Thirdly, the breaking of, and you'll note I have in caps, the bread. There are two breakings of the bread in this passage. The first one is communion. The second one is fellowship or um, hospitality, if you would, of food eating together. Okay, How do I get that? Well, I, some of you will understand this next slide. Most of you are not. Okay, 
You say, okay, I get it. No, you're right. Okay. So, but what I want to point out to you, this is the Greek of both those verses. Okay? And so the word artu or artan is the word for bread. It looks like artan. You can almost see this says artan, right? Anyways, it's the word for bread. But note the difference between the artan down here and up here. This one has the twos. So see the O-U? It kind of joins, it agrees with the O-U over there. You have case, number, gender, agreement whenever you have the definitive article with the noun that it modifies. Thank you so much, yes. Some of you linguistically, Zoe's here. Zoe, you were tracking right with me. Yeah, of course. I'm glad Zoe's here. I know. I've got, a, I've got some of you, so we'll start picking up another class on Greek soon, okay? And you can take Greek, and you can learn it, okay? And I want everybody to learn Greek. You can hold me accountable, okay? But the important part here is that this is a definitive article. It's the bread, the bread, okay? Whereas down here, it's just generic bread. They were breaking bread down here, okay? Here, they broke the bread, Okay, big deal. Okay, to me, not a small thing. That's a big difference. Okay, if you go to First Corinthians ten, when Paul is teaching regarding um, the Israel and idolatry and struggling with idolatry and telling us to flee from the idolatry and stuff like that, he then turns around and says, "The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ?" For we through many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. But literally it says, of the one bread is what it says. And it refers specifically to the. If you go, I don't have time for this, but you can go to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29, specifically down 27 to 29 part of it. It's going to talk about the bread again. Okay, Whenever in the New Testament it was talking about the bread, it's talking about the, the Lord's Supper. When it's talking about bread, generally speaking, it's just talking about food. Okay? So I believe this one is talking about that they they stayed in the remembrance of what God, Jesus, had told them in the Last Supper. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. That's why I don't believe, necessarily, that it was once a year. There are some congregations that celebrate communion once a year, and they celebrate it at the Passover. Now, that would make sense. As often as you do this, do in remembrance of me. As often as you do what? Passover, do in remembrance of me. But I think Jesus was talking about more, as often as you gather together as an assembly for a meal or whatever, do it in remembrance of me. You can take it however you want to look at it, okay? So um, we do it once a month, at, at, at the, the first Sunday of the month. I wouldn't have a problem, and I'm not telling we got to change on this, okay? But I wouldn't have a problem if we did it every Sunday. As often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. Does that make sense? But the whole point is that that's communion, and they gather together. So these early believers, right off the bat, they continued in the breaking of the bread. But then they also continued in the prayers. So again, you see prayers there, but again, there is, I'm not going to bring up the Greek for you on this one, but there is again the definitive article with the prayers, okay? And that only happens a few times in the New Testament. I have those references for you on the sermon note sheet. Okay, and you can look those up if you want to. But we read in Acts 3 1, so we're finishing up chapter 2, right? 41 to 47. But if I would have continued reading in verse 1 of chapter 3, then you would have seen that Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, at the hour of prayer. Okay, there were certain specific prayers that they would do. Remember, this is a Jewish group of people living their Jewish lives. They're just being transformed by Christ. They gathered together in the upper room in the in-between time, and what did they do? They prayed. Well, what did they continue to do? Then after these 3,000 people were, were added to them, they continued to what? Pray. Where was the most likely place for them to pray? The temple. It was large enough to handle 3,000. And so they would gather together, clearly, at the times of prayer. Probably opportunities for them to evangelize. But I can't can't prove that other than some of those that we're going to see where they they heal the the lame man and that kind of stuff and opportunities arise, okay? But I think they went to worship God. 
and they went together for the prayers. So they continued in the prayers. In other words, the, my point here is, in my brain, okay, is they didn't start this brand new whole thing. Prayer was very important to them, and they had set times of prayer. And so uh, for me, I, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me sometimes to remember to pray. I mean, I'm praying through the day, and I get the conversational prayer, and I'm not dimin- diminishing that. But I think there's something about setting time to stop and focus on God and to pray. In the morning, it's easy. I get up, get my coffee, you know, get my shower, get my coffee, go, go out and do my quiet time. At nighttime, it's, that's our ritual, right? We're going to gather together before, before bedtime, and as a minimum, we're going to pray together. Okay? And then I go to bed and I continue to pray because it's just how my body works. Okay? Middle of the day, I'm redeeming the time. Boom, 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 boom. So I've had to place a reminder on my phone. I love technology. So my wife doesn't have to nag me. Somebody else doesn't have to nag me. I nag myself. I make myself a, 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 an alarm to go off in the middle of the day that says what? Pray. Pray. So I just want to challenge you. Think about that. Daniel was a, finish it, man of prayer. Daily prayed he three times. Okay? The, the, the Jews carried this concept into the church. Praying, praying, praying. And so I think it's important for us. Okay? I challenge you to do it. You know, if you have a job and you're, and you're breaking for your lunch, Take time during that, prayer t- during, yeah, during that prayer time to have lunch. Anyways, take time during your lunch time to pray, but take time during your prayer time to have some lunch. That's exactly right, okay? Change the way you think. Everything ought to be kingdom-oriented. And when you become kingdom-oriented and everything, it's amazing how many things ought to change. And the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. It's a true statement. It's amazing. All right. So the effect of the transformation in the community, though, i got to move quickly, was what? Fear came upon every soul. Isn't that kind of amazing? And so fear came upon every soul. Now, there is a concept where fear means to tremble, but there's an idea, though, in that trembling, that there was awe and respect for what was going on. They saw the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them. They saw lives being transformed, and everybody else went, whoa. There was not an aversion to them. There was no antagonism necessary to them. Now we're going to see some because the church is going to continue to grow, right? And it's going to start to, to have an effect upon the world. And the world's um, marketing, their, their, their materialism stuff is going to start changing because of that, okay? And that's usually what causes power and money. You know, when things like that start to change, you, you start getting aggravated at the person who's, who's causing that. And it was the church changing, okay? But right off the bat, there's no aversion. Well, how do I know that? Because... Oh, sorry, go back to that one. Because we're going to find out that the Lord was adding to the church daily, right? But the second thing, with all these people gathering together with this unity, which we're going to talk about again, because they're continuing steadfastly in all these things, right? Many signs and wonders were performed through the apostles. Just real quick point. Note, it is very specific to tell us that the signs and wonders were being performed by the apostles. It doesn't say in the signs and wonders were performed by the church. Now, I understand that God used Philip, okay, and God used some others. But specifically, and we see this elsewhere in in the book of Acts as well, that it was the apostles who God was using to do these sign gifts to demonstrate the validity of, of the gospel as it was being presented, okay? I only say that because there's a lot of people out there who who challenge you, saying, well, if all these signs and wonders were done in the days of Jesus, and we see these signs and wonders in the book of Acts, why aren't we doing them now? And so I'm a cessationist, but I'm not an ultra-cessationist. God can do whatever he chooses to do, okay? And so some of you know that, but like when I was in Peru, in some manner, I spoke Spanish, I don't know Spanish. I don't, you know, un poco, uh, burrito, taco, frio, caliente. That's it. I just blew my, my Spanish, okay? And so, well, maybe I know going to Stias, but that's about it. So, anyways, but God had me memorize five Spanish verses while I was on the plane going down to Peru. So, for me to be able to memorize five Spanish verses 
on the way down. That's a miracle by itself, right? And then he pointed out some other things while we were down there. And these two little kids needed to be witnessed to. Well, my translator was witnessing to a woman at the door. And I said, God, these... And so I tried to tell the, the one kid to tell the other kid. And pff, I don't know Spanish. So I'm saying, you know, uh, dijo amigo or whatever I was saying. I don't know. Is that kind of close? Um, I'm looking at you, Dees. Did I, did I just say said amigo or something like that? D, uh, dijo amigo? Dijo amigo? What did I just say? No, I said dijo. See? Yeah, said amigo, said friend, right? And, and so I'm not communicating because I'm trying to tell him to tell his friend. And I just t- told the kid, said his friend. And he's like, no. And I said, see, see. And he said, no, no. I said, oh, Lord, help me. Because these two little kids need to know. And I, I mean, they're going to leave and whatever. I opened my mouth. And I started Genesis chapter 1, which I'd memorized. And from there, I can't tell you the rest. I just know that somehow God linked verses together. And these kids got it. But when I got to heaven and hell, heaven was cielo because I knew that from Genesis 1-1, but I had no clue what hell was. And I turned my, my little picture thing to it, and the kids go, oh, in fear name. Oh, thank you, Lord. So God, the whole way through, has helped me out on this. Are you tracking what I'm saying? And so by that time, I don't even know how to ask them if they understood anything I just said, because I don't even know what I just said. And so, so I'm pulling on... On, on Joel, that was my translator, my interrupter. And, and, and so Joel, and he's, the woman had just gotten saved. He got her information. It was all exciting. He said, why, why, what, Bob? Uncle Bob, because I was Uncle Bob. And, and what? And I said, I think I witnessed these two guys. Can you find out, like, what they know and what they don't know? They rattled back the gospel, and they got saved. How cool is that? So what I'm saying is, I do believe that God isn't in a box and he can do whatever he chooses to do whenever he chooses to do it. Are you tracking what I'm saying? Okay. But as a whole, the signs, as we saw, again, the gift of languages was given for unbelievers, specifically unbelieving Jews, right, to hear the gospel. All I know is in that moment, there were two unbelievers that needed to hear the gospel and God did whatever it took for those two unbelieving boys to hear the gospel. Okay? Signs and wonders were done through the apostles. I don't want to make it any more than I have to. That's what God's word says. So that's where I stand. Okay? So what about the unity of the church? Because then we get into the unity of the church, and so we want to move fastly through this. We've talked about this a few months ago when we talked about the the marks of a healthy church. Um, And I think David preached through this um, a couple weeks. The evidence of their unity is they had all things in common. So note the word koinos. Okay, it is the root of koinonia. Okay, and so for those who don't know, and I wish I brought my Greek with me, the Greek that we use is uh, written in not high Greek or classical Greek. It's called koine Greek. It was the Greek of the common man. So most of us don't speak high English. We don't speak proper English. We speak, we speak common English. Some of us are even more common than others. Okay, and... Uh, I'm from the city. I'm picking on myself on that one, okay? And so, but the reality is, that's what it is. Common Greek is what this is, okay? So the the word koine or koinos means common. So they had all things in common. Now, again, some people are looking at me like, ah! They were communal in their living, not communistic. The difference between communism and communalism is it the intent? Communal, communal, communism is top down to you, directed to you. The government makes the decision that you're going to share everything you have with everybody else. Communalism is you make the decision. You want to share with other people. Does that make sense? And so communal has a concept coming from communism, okay, that you have things in common, okay? And so they had all things in common. So what do we, what do we read about that then, about having these things? In common, um, they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had what? As had anyone had need. So that's what they did. And so we see that in 1 John three seventeen. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Well, they got that. There, there's a transformation of their lives, right? And they realized immediately 
Psalm 24 applies. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The, the, the earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof. The world and all who live in it. Everything I have belongs to God. I'm just a steward of it. And if God has given me a lot, it's to minister to the people who don't necessarily have a lot. Not, again, communism like everybody has to live at the same level. That's not the point. It's ministering to the what? Needs of the poor within the church, specifically. I don't believe they're ministering to the needs of the poor throughout the community. Now, could they be doing that evangelistically? 100%. But they were ministering to the needs, and we know that from Acts chapter 7, specifically, that when we get, to the, when we get there, we'll see that, the role of widows, that they were specifically meeting the needs of those within the assembly, within the church. Okay, So they did that. They were then of one accord. Okay, They had one mindset. Okay, Verse 46, they continued daily with one accord. Where? First of all, um, oh, we say this requires humility and submission. It does, because we're not always going to agree. But they gathered together. Because they were one accord, then they gathered together daily in the temple and then in their houses. Okay, and the, When they gathered together in the temple, it was for what? Prayer, okay, which was a segment of what? Worship. That's exactly right. Okay, they gathered there for worship. Okay, and then they met in their houses. Okay, and what does it say when they met in their houses? They ate their what? So breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. There we have the what? They're having meals together. They're fe- what we call fellowship, but yeah, they're eating together. They're having meals together. Okay, and so they want to spend time together. They're not just going to to the facility temple, meeting together, and then going home and, and nothing happens. But afterwards, they're getting together in their houses. And I don't think there's a house church. I don't think that's the idea of the house church there, right there. I think that's just, they wanted to get together. They, they had this new bond in Jesus Christ, and they wanted to hang out together. So they got together all the time. Well, what was the effect, then, of their unity in the community? They had favor with all people, and people were being saved. The Lord added to the church daily. And we know from 1 Corinthians 3, 7, some water, some sow, but what? God gives the increase. So here's the deal. God wants to make us what? Fishers of men, yes? He causes the church to be, and he causes the church to, to, to start to meet. But what's the end result of the church in their unity and the church in their growth and the church staying together in proper doctrine? Say, others being saved. Because God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Follow me and I will make you, make you fishers of men. Make you fishers of men. I don't want to lose that concept because that's what's happening. God is causing that to be in the early church. And it's starting to reflect God's plan. So I want to ask right off the bat before we get into those questions, is does this church reflect the early church? What about just the church of the United States? Is it reflecting the early church? And ask yourself that over the next couple weeks as we continue on in this. If you were to take a scorecard, you know, we want to take scorecards when we come to election time and everything, right? But if you're going to take a scorecard and ask, what does this church look like? What does the church of the United States look like? How do we measure up to what God was doing? So how does the transformation of your individual life, though, compare to that of these first believers? Instantaneous obedience? Joining the church? Becoming part and assembly of the common cause? How important is the fellowship of the saints to you? Do you want to get together daily? Or look, I'm just punching my tickets on Sunday morning because God told me to do that and that's all I really want. I really enjoy hanging out with the world more than I enjoy hanging out with the church. There's a statement to be said there. Again, you know, your heart's going to tell you a lot, and we'll talk about that in one moment. How committed are you to the unity and needs of the body? Jesus said, for where, the tr- for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, where's your treasures? Where does the spending of your treasures indicate that your heart is? Again, my activities, what I do, where I spend my money, are going to reveal the priorities of my life. What's important to me? Where do you spend your time? 
Where do you spend your time reading and thinking about? Where do you spend your money? What do you do with your talents that you have? Are they for you or are they for God? Is there then a need to change the way you think and change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the testimony of the early church. Lord, I pray that you would use it to transform my life in the life of this assembly. Lord, help us to be set apart to you, that we would be an impact in this community. Lord, that means that we've got to get outside the four walls of this facility. Lord, I pray that you would bless our times when we knock on the doors, and Lord, that we uh, can meet with people, and that we can um, that we'd have people that want us to begin ministering in their lives and praying for them and, 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 and being involved and in, in, in serving them. But Lord, help us to be involved in the church as well, that it's about us. I thank you, Lord, for other, believing, uh, other groups of believers that are around this community as well. Lord, help us to be mindful of that and to realize that you've got a, a bigger thing going on than just what's going on in this little assembly. Lord, that you would be honored and that you would be glorified, that we would seek to... Um, to, to multiply, uh, if you would, your, your kingdom, Lord, and not our own, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.